Are you ready, Jose? Yeah, I'm ready. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for coming on, man. Appreciate it. Well, it's yeah, my absolutely. pleasure. I'm very happy to be on and to talk about socialism. Hell yeah. Well, I guess to dive right in, could you tell us a little bit about your campaign and uh, why you decided to run? Sure. Yeah. So our campaign is in the 50th congressional district. I mean, there's still some redistricting that's happening following the census. Uh, but, you know, we anticipate the district will look very similar to how it has in the past. Uh, the 50th district is a very large congressional area in uh, California that encompasses about 60 percent of San Diego County and then parts of uh, Riverside County and Imperial uh, County as well. Uh, it's, you know, semi-rural. There's some small municipalities. I mean, California, small, I should uh, specify. So like 100,000 plus people, cities. Uh, but there's a few of those uh, kind of dotted throughout. But it's mostly semi-rural, working class. Uh, and we decided to run our campaign there. That's where I'm from. That's where I met organizers in the PSL uh, during a police brutality uprising in my neighborhood. And, uh, you know, we decided to, to demonstrate that we could organize our, our people in an underserved, under kind of represented area and bring socialism to working people who, you know, may have never, ever met a socialist. So, uh, you know, a lot of people, when they see the, how red the district is, GOP red it is, I guess, uh, they're like, why would you why would you want to be a socialist in such a reactionary area and run a campaign? And uh, we wanted to run the campaign to demonstrate that if we can do it here and if we can bring in, you know, people that are ready for a revolutionary change, you know, in, you know, what is considered, you know, a reactionary area, then there's no reason we can't do this, you know, statewide uh, and just all throughout the country. Yeah, that's a that's a great uh, introduction, Jose. And obviously, thank you again so much for joining the podcast. We really appreciate giving a spotlight to third party candidates and people that are really trying to challenge the Democrat and Republican parties from the outside. I think that's really impressive. And obviously, you know, you're taking on this extremely uphill battle from the outset. This isn't going to be easy. Any third party candidacy is uh, obviously at a massive disadvantage. It's going to be hard to make the media cover your candidacy. It's going to be harder to get your message out. And obviously, it's going to be harder uh, to compete fundraising wise with the incumbent. Uh, so I'm just wondering, where do you start? What kind of coalition are you hoping to build to overcome these odds and actually get in this seat? Are you hoping to turn sure. out voters that aren't normally uh, people that vote? Or are you hoping to draw more uh, from the incumbents voting pool by convincing them that, you know, the establishment candidacy isn't going to work anymore and that they need to embrace this socialist alternative? Right. So, yeah, those are some great questions. So really what our strategy is focusing on, as you mentioned, we are at some serious disadvantages to the capitalist parties. Uh, our you know, party that we're running under, I'm a member of the PSL, but I'm also a registered Peace and Freedom Party voter uh, here in California, uh, doesn't have the resources that you know the Republicans or the Democrats do. And for that reason, we're going to have to really depend on the resources that we have to our advantage, which is our people power and the kind of quality of our organizers that make up our, our local elections team here. So really our strategy is to not only go after basically disaffected uh, voters, right, from you know all walks of life here in the region, um, but I will say it's also going after people that are excluded from the uh, bourgeois electoral process. And ultimately our goal, right, is you know, as much as it would be great, you know, as a, uh, to be able to wrench power from the ruling class through the ballot box, we all know as socialists that that's not that's not the way that this is going to go down. How we're not going to achieve our liberation isn't through the ballot box. So our objectives just fundamentally differ from the liberals and 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 just the kind of entrenched uh, political operatives within this two party system. Our objectives are to mobilize people, regardless of whether or not they have you know earned the right to vote in this you know. Uh, farce of a democracy uh, and to mobilize them for beyond just this uh, election cycle uh, to be able to participate in uh, movements for housing justice and an end to the eviction crisis to, you know, fight in the movement for Medicare for all and universal health care. Uh, these are the things that, are, you know, are really the driving motives behind our campaign and also what really give us our advantage because, you know, while the Democrats and the Republicans, uh, you know, are basically having a professional machine that's just funded by, you know, greed and the desire just to do their job to the base, the lowest common, you know, variable. Uh, our people are all volunteers. Our people are, you know, workers who are seeing the really brutal impact of capitalism and recognizing it's their families, it's their own lives that are tied to their liberation. Uh, so really, you know, when you put our people side by side with some of these, for lack of a better word, political hacks, um, you know, there's really no standing next to each other our people are worth like five of of one of theirs so that's what really our strategy is, is we're going to go in ex you know expecting people to 
under underestimate us, but we're going to, you know, we were, we're used to punching above our weight class and, and, uh, and basically putting all of these millionaires and their kind of, uh, funders on their heels and having to play our game. Yeah. Um, obviously, you know, there's tentative announcements today, uh, that Joe Biden will be, uh, you know, extending the eviction moratorium, but obviously this, it comes, it doesn't meet the moment and, and it will do, uh, you know, doesn't necessarily solve the, the problem. I'm wondering, you know, in, in uh, California's 50, as you said, surrounding San Diego, uh, we've recently heard a lot about Los Angeles, you know, moving, making moves to, you know, uh, ban sleeping in public to, you know, essentially outlaw and criminalize homelessness. I, I'm wondering what kind, uh, what kind of laws and city ordinances you're seeing in, in your own district, uh, how that's affecting people and, uh, you know, how you're able to, you know, um, mobilize uh, uh, around that and, and you know, uh, ensure people that they're entitled to the right of free housing and that, you know, as socialists, you know, we believe that that's something that we could, are capable of. And I'm just wondering if that's a good conversation starter that you've noticed and you said, what, what is a Republican red district, not necessarily a, a commie red district? Sure. Yeah. Housing is the great equalizer. Right. And that's a great way that we use to to basically engage our people in a way that's accessible. I mean, if I just started going off on Lenin, right, as much as like I love reading State and Revolution, that may not always be accessible to like say somebody like a working class person on the trolley, you know, in that in that exact moment. But if I'm able to engage with something that, that, that they're already aware and it's accessible, like they're all, like all of us need housing, uh, that opens up the opportunities to have those more kind of expansive conversations that even include like maybe the works of Lenin or other kind of contemporary thinkers. So as far as like how we use that, and it's, you know, locally, it's a it's a very poignant issue. California uh, and San Diego in particular has seen uh, some of the largest kind of rent jumps and just the cost of housing, ex you know, just exponentially growing uh, year after year. Uh, I know that I think it was the last I saw the second most expensive uh, place to live. That's or the se second fastest growing like home uh, costs in, uh, you know, in the country. So, I mean, we're seeing that also in the district. Uh, obviously, the people that are being pushed out from gentrification, from basically just being priced out of San Diego proper are moving, uh, you know, into the 50th. And, and, you know, displacing the people who are already there, too. And it's just, you know, a compounding the suffering uh, due to this, like, you know, artificial housing shortage is, is what they call it. Uh, really, locally, we've also seen them, you know, weaponize these laws against, like you said, the homeless and the houseless people who, you know, are sleeping or what they call, uh, you know, violating encroachment laws here in San Diego and in, in the region. Uh, we've seen them, you know, take draconian steps like criminalizing the sharing of food during uh you know a pandemic and also you know a previous pandemic for hep a that was happening here in the region in 2000 i believe 16 or 2017 uh so san diego has a long and sordid history of you know passing legislation and the region in general has you know, in, including municipalities in the 50th uh, of passing legislation that targets our most vulnerable neighbors uh so you know we we're part of a coalition that helped organize to get some of the strongest uh, eviction protections in the, uh, in the state. So San Diego, actually, before this announcement by Joe Biden, uh, already had eviction protections for our residents due to a, co a coalition uh, uh, of organizers, including the PSL, but also the Alliance for Californians for Community Empowerment, the Tenants Union, and a bunch of other uh, organizers here locally. So, I mean, we use the housing crisis uh, you know, as a as a really big rallying point, uh, because it unites people across the political spectrum and helps us draw attention, you know, to our who our real enemy is. It's not whoever we're being told by, you know, the liberals or the conservatives, you know, in, in, in power. It's the ruling class that that pits us against each other. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, one other thing I was really wondering if you had an opinion on, um, we took note of India Walden's mayoral victory in the city of Buffalo. She became the first socialist elected to a major American city since 1961, or rather she will be when the actual election is held. She won the Democratic Party primary as a socialist right. candidate. Um, and she actually beat a four term incumbent mayor in Buffalo, New York. Uh, this was something that really blew me away. I was totally shocked when I heard this news. Um, and the first thing I said was we have to study India Walton's blueprint, her success to strategy or her success, her strategy to success, rather um, how she was able to take this working class district uh, and convince them to vote for a socialist. I was just wondering if you have any opinions on Walton's campaign. Um, and if you personally have learned anything from her uh, campaigning techniques as far as how to appeal to working class uh, voters with a socialist perspective. 
Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I'm not too familiar with their campaign, like the intricacies. I do think it's, you know, indicative of a shift uh, that we're seeing nationwide in people's consciousness due to the hard work of of socialists and other organizers who are taking, you know, this this kind of uh, organizing into the, their workplaces, into their neighborhoods, into their schools, and kind of demonstrating the values of socialism uh, to people who, you know, are are friendly and but just have never experienced or been exposed to them. As far as um, you know, what it means, obviously, uh, I actually lived in Buffalo. I played uh, football at the University of Buffalo, New York, uh, for a few years, and um, you know, the the composition of the of, of the region is is a little different than than ours. So there's not a lot that can be directly kind of overlapped, but there's enough uh, that I'm sure uh, that we can kind of focus on, such as I'm sure the focus that they placed on, you know, organizing amongst disaffected uh, workers in a city that had, you know, really, really been negatively impacted by the deindustrialization and just the the greed of uh, of corporations uh, in the former Rust Belt. So being able to like go out and organize amongst people who have been um, uh, left behind by the system of capitalism and to basically re- reinvigorate uh, their optimism in, in getting involved in the in the bourgeois electoral machine away, away from the Democrats. Uh, so, I mean, uh, or at least from the conservative wing of the Democrats. So I do think there's a lot to be taken away from their victory in Buffalo, especially, uh, you know, given, you know, how much money I'm sure was going in to oppose their, their, their election uh, and seemingly just like clear uh, entryway to being the mayor, the next mayor of Buffalo. Um, but you know, it, it's, if anything, from what I'm taking away from this, it's a great reminder of, you know, how a lot of people, you know, will say it's impossible to have any sort of impact, uh, in this kind of arena. And like I said, while I don't believe this is the the vehicle in and of itself for revolutionary change, it's a great opportunity to put our program, uh, as socialists on, you know, out there to, to millions of people potentially, and to, you know, take some of these issues, uh, right into people's homes, just like, you know, as much as I have disagreements with Bernie Sanders, his yeah. impact on being able to bring people to socialism, uh, you know, is indisputable. So, I mean, I'm hoping that we'll see something very similar from more and more of these people coming out and saying, I'm a socialist and running for office. And it's up to us as, you know, socialists also to help define yeah. that and hold well, people accountable. That's super interesting that you say that because that's actually basically the same defense that I just made earlier on the stream of Nina Turner, whose election is today. Uh, and I, you know, likewise pointed out that this clearly will not be the correct vehicle for all the changes that is, are necessary in our society. Um, however, I, I think a similar thing applies. You know, it's, it's a good vehicle to bring these ideas into people's homes, to educate people, to expand the movement, to bring in uh, new uh, young people uh, into uh, politics. Um, so I'm just wondering if you have any comment on that as someone who is very explicitly challenging uh, both capitalist parties from a third party perspective. Um, what, what's your opinion on the Nina Turner race? You know, do you think that's overall a, a win or uh, is it even worth participating in that election? Are you excited? Do you hope she wins? Do you have any comment? I mean, to be honest, I'm not too familiar with that campaign either. I'm like. Uh, have been very heavily focused with, uh, you know, working in, in our campaigns here down in San Diego. But with, with any campaign, um, you know, I think there's a lot of great opportunity uh, for not only the issues that the, the candidates presenting to come into play, but also the, to see the kind of vehicle that is powering the movement behind that particular candidate, right? Like, um, you know, for example, I don't, like I said, I can't really speak to uh, Nina Turner's campaign uh, but I'm always optimistic and excited to see because we've seen our own people here uh, in L.A., but, you know, uh, north of a little north of us, but also all over the state and all over the country run for various offices. We have one of our com- uh, comrades running for uh, the mayor of New York City right now. Um, so, I mean, we, you know, as far as like what my expectations are, I'm, I'm not too privy to the details. So unfortunately, I can't really go into too much of it. But I'm always optimistic and I'm always excited uh, because even if, you know, there's things to critique about the particular candidates, it's just more opportunities for for us as organizers and us as socialists to get out there and contrast whatever they're saying with, you know, whatever, you know, we're saying as real socialists, not to use the, the air quotes, but, you know, if they're going to come out and talk about socialism, but leave out you know, imperialism, that gives us an opportunity to be like, oh, yeah, well, that's great that they're talking about healthcare and housing, but w- but more. We need, you know, a focus on the anti-war movement and all that. So um, that's really my expectations for most of these social Democrat or Democratic Socialist aligned mm-hmm. kind of campaigns is it's great progress for us to be able to expand on our own programs and our own platforms and how, you know, the working class can benefit from those. 
Uh, but ultimately, you know, there are limitations um, to most of to most of these campaigns that are being run through the Democratic Party. Well, that's actually feeds really uh, well into a question that I had for you, Jose. And, th- and that was one, you know, a lot of people might not be super familiar f- with the PSL, the Party for Socialism and Liz- Liberation, as somebody who considered themselves like a real leftist. You know, it wasn't until we spoke with the great L- Gloria Loriva during her presidential race uh, that I really, you know, got familiar with the PSL and, you know, how it differentiates from something like the DSA or, you know, a- another kind of socialist organization. So and, and, and a lot of our audience is feeling really uh, disaffected right now. They felt let down by the progressive movement. They felt betrayed. Uh, you know, all that I you know, sent money that I didn't really have on a women of prayer to Bernie Sanders to, you know, people, AOC, somebody that got into office. And, and then I felt that and a lot of people feel betrayed them. Um, so what is your message to, to those people who, you know, they, uh, they know that these policies that we've been talking about are the right prescriptions for humanity. They know that healthcare is a human right and it should be provided to everybody at no cost. They know that housing is a human right and it should be provided to everybody. Uh, they know that, uh, you know, we have to address these ecological challenges. Uh, you know, they know that we have to address the uh, centuries of imperialism uh, and the crimes committed by the United States military. Uh, they know that we need to do these things, but they just have no faith in the Democratic Party, the, any of these institutions, uh, you know, even challengers uh, like Nina Turner, uh, who are compelling to some, are, aren't necessarily still compelling to others. So where does the PSL fit in there? And, and what would be your outreach to those voters who feel really disaffected? Yeah. So, I mean, the PSL fits in as, you know, as far as when I met them in the parking lot of my dentist office during a police brutality uprising in 2016, I had never met a socialist. I didn't know anything about socialism. And really the, you know, the kind of role that the PSL serves in these, in this, in this political space uh, is to be a bridge between the organizing world and the revolutionary politics uh, that, you know, historically our class has, has championed and, and, and kept alive for, for, you know, decade century at this point right uh and to bridge that with the material conditions for people on the ground uh in the here and now so really you know it's meant to be a working class party made up of workers and volunteers you know funded entirely by working class people to you know take a deli- definitive stance uh you know on principled issues in a way that is disciplined and centralized in a way that you know centers actualizing the goal and achieving liberation and that's what drew me as someone who had no ex- no experience in socialism if anything was probably antagonistic to socialism uh just from my upbringing and 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 being educated in reactionary politics um but you know like the PSL really in my experience and why I'm a member engaged with me kind of on my level came to me you know educated me on things that I wasn't aware of but also let me educate them in ways that, you know, maybe they weren't fluent to the experience of somebody like myself growing up in East County, San Diego. Uh, So really the role of the PSL is to be the vehicle for revolutionary change for working people to basically take the power that they feel has been basically stripped from them that they don't have and to retake it and to, and to, and to actualize it uh, in its most efficient way. So really what I would say to all these people that are feeling disaffected, that are feeling, you know, uh, cynical about the future. I would say, you know, five years ago, I was just some person in a parking lot minding my own business. And now I'm running for Congress. Now I'm part of a team of people that have helped build a party, you know, presence here in our region that now can do dozens of things, you know, in a month and, and, and actually has the capacity to, you know, fight for things like these eviction moratoriums and, and, you know, holding greasy landlords accountable and fighting for national liberation. So, I mean, what I would say to those people just as a quick summary is get involved today, not tomorrow, because our human liberation is achievable. And all of us as working class people have the strength and have the tenacity that's required to not only build the movement that we need, but to win. And ultimately, when we recognize that, that's when we actually uh, become dangerous to the status quo and, and the ruling class. So I would just encourage those people, whether it's the PSL, I would always, of course, rep the PSL because of just the impact that it's had in my life as someone, like I said, who wasn't educated on socialism uh, and is now you know, willing to like fight and go out and, and do it and do the, do, the, do the thing for it. Uh, if not with the PSL, then if there's, you know, if there's a void in your area, be, you know, the person that builds the organization that fills that void. Um, but yeah, no, that's, that's all I would say to people who are looking to get involved. 
That's a great message. Um, one last question I had for you, Jose, is just what would a PSL candidate in Congress look like? You know, we obviously don't have any uh, officially socialist third party candidates or members of the Congress right now. Um, but what would it look like if you actually got in there? You know, would you try to be, you know, making deals with Pelosi and stuff? <laughs> or would you be like a wrecking ball? You know, like, you know, are, are you going to be out there calling out the establishment, Democrat and Republican, you know, really just being an organizer and an activist, you know, on the ground there? Uh, or will you try to take a more backroom approach where you to get elected? You know, I'm just wondering what kind of tactics you'd actually be applying were you to get elected to, to get the results you want? Sure. Yeah. No. That's a, that's a that's a fair question. So, if we were elected to office, um, you know, our priorities would be to, you know, obviously, you know, push, uh, you know, programs and try to push legislation that will, you know, draw attention to the contradictions of the capitalist system and this mythology of like, oh, there's nothing we can do, as we're seeing with the the Democratic majority in Congress and in the presidency right now, where they kind of just hold their hands up and be like, there's nothing we can do about a lot of these issues that they arguably could resolve almost overnight if they you know, had any sort of real motive to do that, uh, and if there wasn't class antagonisms, obviously. So, I mean, it would be a compilation kind of of both what you're saying. We would obviously want to work with the progressive, you know, other progressive elements, I guess, uh, within Congress, whoever they may be, to you know, push legislation and to try and make it accessible to try and draw out those contradictions and, and bring people's attention to them. But obviously, a big part of, you know, what we would be doing is is basically shouldering that responsibility of being, you know, elected into office as a socialist, as a revolutionary socialist, and basically turning up and, and calling out these uh, politicians in the halls of power on the issues of, for example, the decades-long illegal embargo and blockade of Cuba, uh, the illegal sanctions that are crippling uh, the country of Venezuela, who, through no fault of their own, is just aspiring for sovereignty and, for, uh, and to pursue their own uh, life and happiness. So, I mean, we would be you know, really bringing a lot of what we we do here in San Diego to a national stage and really kind of forcing them to to either, you know, force our hand or or address their own contradictions. Obviously, our impact as individuals is limited. Right. So we there's no you know illusions that we have that, like, suddenly if we get elected, then obviously space communism happens tomorrow. Right. Um, as, as great as that would be, you know, if we were elected, it would be, you know, the tip of the spear that allows us to basically continue to breach and draw out these contradictions and and build a movement that not only just like hopes that the ruling class gives us power, but seizes power and actually holds on to it. Well, I think that's the important part right there. You just hit the nail on the head. You know, obviously we can all prescribe, uh, you know, uh, problems right we can see them with our own eyes they're everywhere the the real trouble is getting somebody to go in there and fucking do it and and everything you said right there jose man that sounds pretty base to me it sounds like stuff that i could get behind that sounds like a lot of things that people in our audience could get behind and if they're interested inspired by the words that you've said where can they go to find out more about volunteering uh you know donating to their campaign uh things like that yeah, so we have social media. We have Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all of that. Cortez for Congress, that's where you're going to want to go to follow our campaign. We're having a volunteer orientation, I believe, in the next couple of weeks. So if you're in the 50th District, which is basically the majority of San Diego County and a large chunk of the unincorporated areas, um, then, yeah, you definitely want to get involved, uh, meet up with our people. We're very active. There's not very very rarely is there a week where we're not out doing stuff you can find links to our um fundraising both for our office the san diego justice center that's a community uh center space that we operate uh as well as uh you know fundraisers specifically for our campaign uh but yeah if people want to get involved definitely reach out to us we're very responsive and our whole thing is connecting us and getting more people to do what we're doing because if i can do it literally anybody can <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Jose. Really enjoyed the conversation. We love to platform third party um, candidates on our show. We really think it's an important element of the electoral process. And we wish you the best of luck. We uh, look forward to speaking again. If you ever want to come back on and share an update about your campaign, our campaign, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, we really do enjoy platforming and fostering solidarity with our third party candidates, which, like I said, are just up against so many odds. You know, I really admire the fact that People that run third party, you know, acknowledge off the bat that it's going to be an uphill battle, but they wage that fight anyway. And, you know, it's just so important to have people out there spreading these messages and educating the people that, you know, they really aren't. They don't have to just vote for these corporate tools of the capitalist establishment. There are real, real alternatives, real people that are actually trying to fight for them. So thanks for all that you're doing, man. And uh, thanks for joining us today. 
Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you all for having me on. And, you know, I appreciate the opportunity to come out and, and talk about building working class power. So you all have a great rest of your day. You too, man. Take care. Thank you.